um, we are going to be discussing the digestive system today. So let's bring up my PowerPoint and then we'll get started. So with the digestive system, this I would probably say is one of the systems that most people are pretty familiar with. We think about digestion and most of us think about eating, we think about defecation, we think about nutrients, chewing, things like that. And already, we've already listed off some of the major functions of the digestive system. So let's get into it. The main functions of the system will be to take in food. Then we're going to break down those foods into nutrients. We will absorb those nutrients into our bloodstream. And then we will get rid of any waste products that are left within our bodies. So when you think of the digestive system, we, of course, course want to talk about the major organs that are associated with it. So the digestive system has a major canal and we can call this major canal a few different terms. We can refer to it as the alimentary canal, as the gastrointestinal canal, or the GI tract, or the gut. So depending on who you're talking to, what textbook you're reading, you're going to hear one of these four variations of the groupings of the digestive system. And so either way, I like to say the GI tract, um, it's going to have a continuous muscular tube that will run from the mouth to the anus. And with, uh, along that tube, we're going to involve processes of digesting the food, which is going to basically be taking those food substances and breaking them down from their larger compounds until their smaller compound substances. Then we're gonna have absorption to occur, and then we're going to have, of course, elimination of the waste product. Now, the major organs of the digestive system are going to be the oral cavity, or your mouth. Then we're gonna to go to the throat, that we call the pharynx, your esophagus, your stomach, your small intestines, your large intestines, and then finally your anus. So these are all of the major organs of the digestive system. We do have some accessory structures that are associated with the system that will help to aid in some of the processes and functions of the system. So first being our teeth, <laughs> then we have our tongue, we have the gallbladder, we have the liver, salivary glands, and then the, pa the pancreas. The digestive glands are going to be housed within the liver, the salivary glands, and the pancreas, and we'll get into that in just a little bit. So here we have an overview of our digestive system and the um, accessory structures that are associated with it. So starting here, we have the oral cavity, and in the oral cavity, we know that we have teeth there, we see our tongue, and then we see some of our salivary glands. So the salivary glands, when we say that, we're collectively referring to all of the different types of glands that we have within the oral cavity. So the largest one is going to be our parotid gland, which we have right here. Then we go into the sublingual gland, and that makes sense, sublingual under the tongue. And then we have these submandibular glands once again under the mandible. From the oral cavity, we're going to have food passing through the pharynx. And remember, the pharynx is one organ that is also shared with the respiratory system. And then from the pharynx, the food and liquid will travel down the esophagus to our stomach. It will then pass into the small intestines, through the large intestines, and then out through the anus. Um, notice that the major organs of the digestive system are going to be those structures that food and liquid actually come in contact with. And that was a way that was easy for me to remember the differences between major organs of the system and the accessory organs of the system. So does food come in contact with my mouth? Yes. Does food come in contact with my stomach? Yes. Does food come in contact with the liver? No. So the liver would be an accessory structure. Now, teeth and tongue, kind of doesn't follow that rule because obviously your teeth and your tongue do come in contact with the um, with our food. But outside your teeth and your tongue, your liver, your gallbladder, your pancreas, your glands themselves, they don't physically come in contact with your food. Um, some other things that I want to point out, when you think of the small intestines, there are three regions that you do want to know. The duodenum or the duodenum, as I learned, um, is going to be the first portion of the small intestines that connects right around here 
to the stomach. Um, the jejunum is going to be the middle portion of the intestines, and then the ileum is going to be the lateral portion of the small intestines that then connects into the large intestines. When we look at the large intestines, we can further break that down into a specific section. So we have our cecum that's going to directly connect to the ileum. Then we have the ascending colon, the transverse colon, the descending colon, the sigmoid colon that kind of looks like an S. So we're like, so we're right around this area here, sigmoid colon. Then we're going to have the anus, the anal canal, I mean, I'm sorry, the rectum, the anal canal, and then the anus. Alrighty, so let's start off with our digestive processes. So we are going to begin with ingestion. And ingestion is exactly what it sounds like, ingesting food or liquid and eating, essentially. So then from ingestion, another function of our digestive system is gonna be propulsion. So we take in food and liquid, but we also need to be able to move these substances through the alimentary canal or the GI tract. And so propulsion by definition is gonna be the movement of food through the alimentary canal, and it's going to include a couple of steps. First is swallowing, because we have to get it from the oral cavity to start en route down the alimentary canal. And then we have peristalsis. So by now we've seen this, this term peristalsis before. And so this is gonna involve the waves of contractions that are going to propel food through the alimentary canal. And sorry, I had a... <laughs> something floating in front of me. Um, and it's going to involve alternating ways of contraction and relaxation that are going to push and propel food and liquid through the GI, through the GI tract. So we have a diagram here showing us how these waves of contractions are able to propel food through the GI tract. And we're seeing it with peristalsis. So Something to note with peristalsis is that it's going to involve adjacent segments of the alimentary canal organs that are alternatingly contracting and relaxing. So these are going to be um, organs that are near each other. So oral cavity to throat or throat to esophagus versus another way that we can propel food along the GI tract is through segmentation. And segmentation is a little different because it's going to involve non-adjacent segments of the, alimentary, of the alimentary canal organs that will contract and relax. And so food is moved forward and backwards and there is some movement of food, but peristalsis is going to primarily propel food and liquid along the GI tract. Segmentation, think more of like, like a mixing type of motion. Um, or I should say, think of it as the portion of movement that really is going to mix and turn your food and kind of moving it along. So with segmentation, instead of moving food through ways of contractions down the GI tract, segmentation is going to take our food, pull it apart, push it back together, pull it apart, push it back together. So this constant mixing of pulling it apart, pushing it back together allows for food to be mixed together. It allows us to also help to break food down into smaller portions. And there's going to be, like I said, some movement that will occur with the constant mixing and pulling, you know, pulling apart, pushing together, pulling apart, pushing together. So you're going to get some movement, but it's not going to be as efficient as peristalsis. And if that doesn't make sense, you know, leave me a comment in the um, comment section below and I'll be glad to further elaborate on that. So mechanical breakdown is going to be our third process of digestion. And this is going to be the actual physical manipulation of our food. And I say food mostly because we don't really, you know, chew our to our water and things like that. But it's gonna be the physical manipulation of food to physically break it down. So first we think of chewing, then we think of mixing food with saliva because we do have some enzymes within our saliva that begin to break down food and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Then we have turning of the food in the stomach and then segmentation, that process that we just talked about that involves um, pulling food apart, pushing it together to help mix food. Once we are finished with mechanical breakdown, then we get into digestion. And digestion is really going to be involving 
metabolic processes that are going to physically break down compounds from larger substances into smaller substances. So think all the way back to chapter two in AMP1 when we're talking about catabolic reactions and we're literally taking larger compounds and then breaking them down into smaller ones. This is literal digestion, right? Right. So then we get into absorption. So now that we have broken these organic compounds into their smaller substances, so as a reminder, we've got you know, polysaccharides into monosaccharides, and then we have um, large lipid substances. So it could be cholesterol. We could have large chains of fatty acids broken down into smaller lipid substances. And then we've got large proteins broken down into amino acids. Once we get these substances into their smallest Form, now we're able to absorb them either directly into the bloodstream or we're going to absor absorb them into the lymphatic system. And we'll get into that in just a bit. And then lastly, what is not absorbed in the body has to be eliminated or should. Because I'm pretty confident not all of us out there are defecating, even on the daily. So <laughs> technically, Whatever is not absorbed, we actually should be eliminating from our body. And that's where defecation comes into. It's the process by which we compact the waste product, we reabsorb the water so that we can eventually eliminate the feces from our bodies. So here we have a diagram showing us a diagram of the different processes that we just talked about. So we ingest through the oral cavity. We begin some of the mechanical breakdown in the oral cavity, so we chew our food, um, we use our teeth and things like that tearing food apart. Then we swallow and then propel the food through the alimentary canal. And so move, food will move down the esophagus. And then once the food gets into the stomach, we'll then get turning, we'll have segmentation occurring, pulling the food apart, mixing it back together. And then digestion is going to occur um, more completely in the small intestines. And then we'll have absorption in the small intestines, and then eventually when we get to the large intestines, we're going to have defecation processes to occur so that we can eliminate the waste product. So how is the digestive system organized? Meaning what tissues, what cells, what body cavities make up this particular system? So this is going to be a refresher from chapter four when we're talking about our tissues and also chapter one, whoa, one, when we're talking about body cavities. So remember the term peritoneum. So that's gonna involve our serous membranes that are going to line the abdominal pelvic cavity. And so remember the visceral peritoneum is gonna be the serous membrane that's gonna actually cover our um, organs, our digestive organs in this case. And then the parietal peritoneum is going to line the uh, peritoneal cavity. Remember that the peritoneal cavity is going to be the physical cavity that we're going to find these digestive organs in, and then between the two serous between the two serous membranes, we'll have fluid that's going to fill the space. Now we also have mesenteries. So mesenteries are going to be double layers of peritoneum that kind of fold over each other. They're going to extend from the body wall to the digestive organs. And so functionally, they are there to provide routes for blood vessels, lymphatic vessels, and nerves, and they're also gonna hold our organs in place. Now, depending on where the organs are situated in the peritoneal cavity, we can further classify them. So we have some organs that we call intraperitoneal or peritoneal organs. And these are just organs that we find located within the peritoneum. I have a diagram, I mean a picture showing you all what this looks like if this is not really making too much sense right now. And then we have what we call retroperitoneal organs that are gonna be organs that are located outside or on the posterior side to the peritoneum. So our retroperitoneal organs are going to include the pancreas, most of the pancreas, the duodenum, and then parts of the large intestines. So here we have a diagram of the abdominal pelvic cavity. Let's take a transverse section. And so now we're looking down on the um, abdominal pelvic cavity. So if this is our peritoneal cavity, or the abdominal pelvic area, I should say. Here's gonna be the parietal peritoneum. 
So that's gonna be the serous membrane lining, the peritoneal cavity. The peritoneal cavity will be this space in the middle. And then this inner orange space is going to be our visceral peritoneum with the alimentary canal running down the middle. Now, most digestive organs are intraperitoneal, meaning that they are housed within the peritoneal cavity. So they're gonna be housed in this area here within the peritoneal cavity. Um, and they are suspended away from the body wall by a dorsal mesentery. So if this is our dorsal mesentery, this is the peritoneal cavity, then we have some, um, here we have an example of the liver. So some of our, some of the intraperitoneal digestive organs are also spent, are, are also suspended from the um, body wall by a ventral mesentery. So if you think about it, remember the term dorsal means on the back side and ventral means anteriorly or belly side. So we're just saying that there is sometimes going to be a dorsal mesentery that's going to hold the organs in place. Sometimes there's a ventral mesentery that will do the same thing. And then if an organ is retroperitoneal, here we see the organ residing outside of the peritoneal cavity. Um, and basically they, they lost their mesentery during development. Okay, so what's a complication that can occur with the peritoneal cavity? We have peritonitis. So this is going to be inflammation of the peritoneum. And this can be caused by either piercing the abdominal wall, um, if you have a perforating ulcer, or a ruptured appendix. Now this can be fatal, and this can be definitely harmful to the body because the peritoneal coverings are gonna to stick together when this occurs and basically trap any bacteria or foreign substances within the um, peritoneum. That's gonna basically localize the infection but allow for it, if it is an infection, to really grow and fester. So any type of treatment that would uh, be given to this person is going to involve um, removing the debris and then giving high doses of antibiotic, especially if the infection, or especially if the inflammation is, is caused by some type of bacterial infection. Now, of course, with any system, we have to talk about histology, which is going to be the tissues that make up the alimentary canal. So we have four major tissues, and the innermost layer to the outermost layer is going to involve the mucosa, the submucosa, muscularis externa, and then the serosa. So the mucosa is going to be a tunic layer that lines the lumen. So remember, anytime we hear that word lumen, we're talking about an open space. So the mucosa is going to have a tunic layer that's gonna line the lumen, the open space that food would travel through, food and liquid. And in terms of functions, there are different layers that perform one or all three of these given functions. So depending on what part of the alimentary canal we are actually looking at, the mucosa can perform one of these or all three of these. So we can have secretion occurring at this, la at this layer. Um, so we're gonna have secretion of mucus, digestive enzymes and hormones. We can have absorption that can occur and that would be at the end products of digestion and then we can have protection against diseases. So having already maybe some bacteria there um, or some lymphatic, um, some lymphocytes there that would be able to protect that part of the body from pathogens. The mucosa is gonna be made up of three sublayers. We have the epithelium that will then be supported by the lamina propria that will then have the muscularis mucosae. So for the epithelium, the specific type of epithelium that we find lining the mucosa will be the simple columnar epithelium, and it's going to have mucus secreting cells in most of the alimentary canal. So we find this epithelia in the mouth, esophagus, um, I'm sorry, the mouth, the esophagus, and the anus are made up of stratus, stratified squamous epithelia, a thicker type of epithelia, which makes sense because when you think about it, your mouth, the esophagus, and your anus is going to involve actions that are going to potentially have more friction. So I think about eating, or I think about children putting things in their mouths. Like a lot of things are put in our mouths that could irritate the tissue there. Um, if I'm eating in a chicken wing contest, I'm so I'm trying to eat 
the most amount of wings, but these wings are crazy hot. I go to swallow that food, it's gonna burn the, the lining of my esophagus. Or when I go to defecate, the actions of defecation are not always you know, smooth and without friction. So you would want the, the tissue there to be more durable, um, which is why we do have stratified squamous epithelia there. And also in terms of secreting mucus, once again, this is gonna protect the digestive system organs from enzymes because we do have enzymes that are there to um, catalyze and break down our foods, but sometimes the enzymes can irritate our tissues there. So we have mucus to help to protect that and also to ease food passage. So, you know, I know sometimes if I eat like really thick bread, I kind of feel like it gets stuck here and then you kind of feel it moving really, really slow. Um, so we do have mucus lining the um, digestive tract to help move those things a lot smoother so it, things don't get stuck. And then two, depending on once again, where we are in the body, the epithelium can secrete enzymes and hormones, like for instance, in the stomach and the small intestines. And we'll get into that in just a bit. The lamina propria is gonna be made up of loose areolar connective tissue. It's gonna have a rich supply of blood capillaries there that are needed for nourishment and absorption. And then it's also gonna contain some lymphoid follicles that help to defend against pathogens. So remember the terms MULT when we were talking about, or when you were learning about the um, lymphatic system. So they are mucosa-associated lymphoid tissues. And we find these patches of lymphoid tissue along the digestive tract, primarily when we get to the um, small intestines. And basically they're just there so that if pathogens get there that shouldn't be there, we can try to get rid of them um, so that they're not harming the body. And then the muscularis mucosae is gonna be composed of smooth muscle, that's going to produce local movement of the mucosa. So here we have a diagram showing us the basic structure of the alimentary canal regarding those four layers of tissue. So starting with the innermost layer, we have our mucosa. So here's our mucosa. Remember, it's going to involve tissue that will line the lumen, this open space here. And then moving on to the second layer, we have the submucosal layer, which is gonna be right along here. And then the muscularis externa is going to involve our um, thick muscular layer right here. And then the last layer will be the serosa, right along here. And we'll see this picture again. So the submucosa is gonna consist of areolar connective tissue. It's gonna contain blood vessels and lymphatic vessels lymphoid follicles, and then the submucosal nerve plexus that will surround the GI tract. It has an abundant amount of elastic fibers um, that will help the organs to retain their shape from expanding and relaxing, especially if, they're, if we just ate a really large meal. So then we move on to the muscularis externa. This is gonna be the thicker muscular portion of the GI tract. And this is gonna be responsible for segmentation and peristalsis. So when you look at the muscularis externa, it's gonna contain an inner layer of muscle that is circular and then an outer layer of muscle that is longitudinal. And then the circular layer thickens in some areas to form sphincters, which sphincters are gonna be structures that will open and close based upon pressure. And then the outermost layer of the alimentary canal will be the serosa. So it's gonna be made up of the visceral peritoneum. So basically the outer layer of the organ. It's gonna be formed from areolar connective tissue and it's gonna be covered by, covered by mesothelium, which is gonna be a single layer of squamous epithelium. Um, it's gonna be replaced by fibrous adventitia in the esophagus, excuse me. So um, this is going to be the dense connective tissue that holds the esophagus to the surrounding structures. And then retroperitoneal organs have both adventitia and serosa. So basically, if we are looking at the esophagus, the esophagus will have adventitia versus the serosa. And once again, here's that same diagram that we saw before. Now, how is blood what is the blood supply of the digestive system and how is it supplied there? So we get into the splenic circulation. So this is gonna involve arteries that branch off of the aorta and serve the digestive organs. So we have the hepatic, splenic, and left gastric arteries, 
and then the inferior and the superior mesenteric arteries. And then for the hepatic portal circulation, this is gonna drain nutrient-rich blood from the digestive organs and then deliver the blood to the liver for processing. And we'll talk more about this later on in this chapter, but our liver is such a huge detoxifier of our blood. And so we'll get into that, like I said, a little later on. So how do we control the digestive system? In other words, how does the nervous system communicate with our digestive system to allow for these processes of digestion to occur? And so what's interesting is that the GI tract has its own nervous system, and we call that the enteric nervous system. It's also called the gut brain. Some people have heard of that term before, and basically it's, it's, it is the GI tract nervous system. So it's going to contain more neurons in the spinal cord. And if you remember from a few, this is from AMP1, the spinal cord has 31 pairs of nerves. So if you think about it, that brain has more than that. The gut brain is made up of enteric neurons that will communicate extensively with each other. And the major nerve supply to the GI tract wall is what controls motility of substances through the GI tract. So here we have a diagram showing us in yellow the extensive network of the enteric nervous system. So these neurons in the gut brain make up the bulk of two main interconnecting intrinsic nerve plexuses. Remember that a nerve plexus is going to be a branching off of nerves from a major a branching off of neurons from a major nerve. So we have the submucosal nerve plexus, that's going to regulate glands and smooth muscle in the mucosa. And then we have the myenteric nerve plexus, that's going to control GI tract motility, movement of substances along the GI tract. So the enteric nervous system participates in both short and long-term reflex arcs. And remember, reflex arc is going to be an involuntary reaction to a stimulus. So short reflexes are gonna be mediated by the enteric nerve plexus or the gut brain, and it's gonna to respond to a stimulus in the GI tract. Whereas long reflexes are gonna to respond to stimuli arousing inside and outside the gut, such as from the autonomic nervous system. So if it's from the parasympathetic nervous system, it might enhance the digestive processes. If it's from the sympathetic nervous system, it's gonna inhibit digestion. So for instance, if I am smelling food, right, then that smelling of food is going to trigger my digestive processes. So let's say you're out, you're walking, and you're already hungry, and then you smell pizza. I love pizza, so that's why I said pizza. I smell pizza, I'm like, ooh, ooh, that smells good, and I'm hungry. Notice what starts to happen. Your mouth starts producing saliva. Your stomach might start growling. And the growling is not necessarily just like, hey, I'm hungry, but it's actually the preparation of your digestive tract thinking food will be coming soon. And the opposite, and an, and an example of long, reflex, long reflexes and outside stimuli affecting digestive processes, let's say you heard I don't know. No, I don't want to say. I don't want to put anything like that. Let's say you're outside walking and then you're on your phone and you look up and there's a lion right in front of you and it growls. Your sympathetic nervous system is going to kick in, right? Because you're going to have an, an adrenaline rush that's going to either say fight it or flight it. Are you going to be hungry? Are you going to feel like eating? Probably not because your sympathetic division is going to turn off or inhibit digestion and inhibit the signaling of let's time to eat because right now we don't have time to eat because we actually need to survive a particular situation. Okay, so here is basically an, an example of what I just explained. So we have external stimuli that are going to target the nervous system and that could involve sight of food, smell of food, taste of food, even thinking about food. Like right now I am hungry. So consistently saying the word food, like my mouth has saliva, I'm ready to eat. Because of the triggering or the external stimuli in, in hopes of getting food soon. 
So like I said, with short reflexes, these are gonna occur entirely within the gastrointestinal wall. So an internal stimuli and an example of that would be changes in the GI tract stretch um, that will either stretch the lumen if food is actually already going through there, or we could have a change in the pH. We could also have a, con a change in what's actually in the GI tract. So a short reflex is gonna be stimulated by something directly, something that is directly in the GI tract, whereas a long reflex is going to involve stimuli that could be outside of the GI tract and it also could be inside of the GI tract, but it's going to involve more of the central nervous system and how the, the central nervous system might aid in digestion or inhibit digestion. So we have three key concepts that regulate GI activity. Number one, we have digestive activity is provoked by a range of mechanical and, chem and chemical stimuli. So what we mean by that is we have receptors that are located in the GI tract organs that will respond to stretch, meaning that if I am eating a whole bunch of food and my stomach begins to stretch to accommodate the food that I've eaten, that is going to stimulate GI tract activity if we have change in, changes in osmolarity and pH, and if we have the presence of substrate and end products that are due to digestion, breaking, taking larger compounds and breaking them down into smaller ones. Another basic concept is going to be effectors of digestive activity are smooth muscles and glands, meaning that when the nervous system sends out a message so that the GI tract can respond to it, the effectors are going to either be smooth muscles or they're going to be glands. Excuse me, so when stimulated, receptors will initiate a reflex that will stimulate smooth muscle to mix and move lumen contents. And then these reflexes can also activate or inhibit digestive glands that will secrete digestive juices or hormones. So the last basic concept of regulating digestive activity is going to involve neurons and hormones. These neurons can be intrinsic or they can be extrinsic. So the nervous system will, the nervous system will control the digestive system either intrinsically or extrinsically. So intrinsic control is going to involve a short reflexes, meaning the, in, the enteric nervous system, so direct stimuli to the GI tract, and then extrinsic control, extrinsic exit outside, is going to involve long reflexes. And so this is going to involve the autonomic nervous system and how the GI tract is stimulated. Is the stimulus, the stimulus could be external, see food, smell food, thinking of food, or it could be internal. Hormonal control is gonna involve hormones from cells in the stomach and the small intestine that will stimulate target cells in the same or different organs to secrete or contract. And we'll get into all of that in just a little bit. So, functional anatomy of the digestive system. So, now we get into looking at the actual organs and accessory structures and how they aid in digestion. So, starting with the oral cavity or our mouth. So mouth is where food is chewed and mixed with enzyme containing saliva that begins the process of digestion. And then swallowing the, and sw and the swallowing process is initiated. So when we think of associated organs with the oral cavity, we have the mouth, obviously, the tongue, salivary glands, and teeth. So the mouth is also called the oral or buccal cavity. It's bounded by lips anteriorly. We have cheeks that are laterally. We have a palate that is superiorly and a tongue that's inferiorly. Then we have the oral orifice, which is the anterior opening. And then we have the walls of the mouth that are lined by stratified squamous epithelia, which we talked about just a little bit ago. Um, we have tough cells that resist abrasion. And then we have cells of the gum, a hard palate, and part of the tongue that are keratinized for extra protection. Because like we talked about before, we don't want the oral cavity to not be durable. So we do have these extra protective measures to make sure that it is. 
In terms of the lips and cheeks, our lips, we formally call them labia. Our cheeks, we can call, are, are gonna be composed of the buccinator muscles. The oral vestibule is gonna be um, the recess that's internal to the lips and the cheeks, and then external to the teeth and the gums. Then we have the oral cavity proper that lies within the teeth and the gums. And then we have the labial frenulum, which is gonna be the median attached to each lip to gum. So if you're looking at it, I don't know if y'all can see me too well, but that strip of tissue that connects your tongue to the floor of your mouth, that is what we are referring to when we say the labial frenulum. This can also be snipped. Um, I worked for an oral surgeon and a lot of times we saw children come in whose um, labial, I'm sorry, I'm thinking of the lingual frenulum, not the labial frenulum. The labial frenulum is going to be the one that, um, is down here. The lingual frenulum is the one that connects the tongue to the floor of the mouth. So the labial frenulum is the one right here. Sorry about that, guys. I just was like, wait a second. We're not there yet, but we will talk about that. So here we have the anatomy of the oral cavity, and we can see the different parts. So we are um, starting off with the soft and hard palate. So our soft palate is going to be right in this area here, whereas the hard palate is going to be more of the roof of the mouth um, where we can find bone. Then we have the oral cavity, which is really the space of our mouth area. We have our palatine tonsils that we find right along here. The uv uvula, which is gonna be what people see when you open your mouth, it's that little dangly thing in the back of your mouth. Um, then we get into the tongue, this long, or this larger muscular structure here. And then we get into the pharynx, which we can divide the pharynx into the oral pharynx, the laryngopharynx, and um, orolaryngopharynx. I'm missing one. Hold on, I'm missing one. I'll keep talking, but it'll come back to me. Um, then we have our lingual tonsil right along here. The epiglottis is right here. So remember, we talked about the epiglottis in the respiratory system. So when we are eating and drinking, um, we have the epiglottis that will cover the trachea every time we swallow so that food and liquid cannot get into our lungs. And y'all, you know, this is really gonna bother me. So give me one second. Because I, for some reason, cannot remember the three parts of the pharynx. Nasopharynx. Okay. That's why I was like, what is that last part? The nasopharynx, we don't see in this diagram because that deals more with the nasal cavity. And when we're talking about food, we're not, food and liquid should not be in the, um, the nasal uh, area. So that's why we don't have it. Um, shown here, but I was like, there is another part, and why am I blanking out on that? Okay, the laryngopharynx is going to be the part of the throat that does interact with the larynx or our voice box, and then we see the esophagus here, and our trachea would be here, so we can see how the epiglottis, when folded back, when we swallow, will propel food and liquid down the esophagus and not down the trachea. So we have our palates. They're going to form the roof of the mouth, and they have two distinct parts. We have a hard palate, and then we have a soft palate. Like I said before, the hard palate is going to be composed of bones that are going to help to um, give the um, give the roof of the mouth some type of structure. And then we have our soft palate that's going to be formed by skeletal muscle, so it'll close off the nasopharynx while we're swallowing so that food and liquid don't go up through the nose, it does happen. But that's why the majority of the time, we don't have food and liquid going up through our uh, nasopharynx and kick it into our nasal cavity. And then the uvula are gonna be finger-like projections that face downward from the free edge of the soft palate. Here, we're just looking at another view of the oral cavity. And so I'm just gonna move, on, I'll move right on along. So moving on to the tongue. The tongue is going to occupy the floor of the mouth, 
and it's going to be composed of interlacing bundles of skeletal muscle. And so functions of the tongue will be a, to grip, reposition, and mixing of our food while we're chewing. And then we do all of this to form a bolus. And by definition, a bolus is just going to be a mixture of food and saliva. And then also the tongue will initiate swallowing. It will assist in speech, and then it will also help us taste our food and liquid. So we have intrinsic muscles that change the shape of the tongue. Then we have extrinsic muscles that alter the tongue's position. And then we have our lingual frenulum, that structure right there that attaches um, to the floor of the mouth. And that's the part that we can see with young children when the tongue is too restricted and it affects their ability to eat and speak. If we're looking at the tongue itself, it's going to have some peg-like projections that um, are going to be found in the underlining mucosa. So we have filiform papillae that gives the tongue its roughness. If you've ever felt your tongue or anything like that, it is kind of rough. Um, it's only one that does not contain taste buds. So we've got different types of papillae. This particular one does not have taste buds. So it gives the tongue its whitish appearance. Then we have the fungiform papillae, which are going to have a mushroom type shape. They're scattered widely over the tongue. There's a vascular core that causes the reddish appearance of the tongue. And more times than not, our tongues look, our tongues look more red than they do white. And then we have the circumvallate papillae, and this is about 8 to 12 V-shaped row that we find in the back of the tongue. And there's a picture of it too. Um, and then we have foliate papillae, which are located on the lateral aspects of the posterior of the tongue. Lastly, we have the terminal, terminal sulcus, and it's a groove that's located on the pos located posteriorly to the valate papillae or the circumvallate papillae. It marks the division between the body of the tongue and the root of the tongue. It does not contain papillae, but it is still bumpy because of our lingual tonsils. So here we have a diagram showing us our tongue. So here we have the epiglottis. Here we have part of our palatine tonsils located right here. Um, here we have our lingual tonsils. And then here we have our terminal sulcus right here. So on the sides of our tongues is where we find our folate papillae. So right here and right here. And then these are the 8 to 12 rows of circumvallate papillae that make that V-shape. Um, here's the medial sulcus of the tongue. We have the fungiform papillae that give the tongue its reddish appearance. And then here is the filiform papillae that give the tongue its whitish appearance. Okay, so let's talk about another type of homeostatic imbalance. So we have ank. Give me a second. <laughs> Ankyloglossia. This is a congenital condition in which children are born with an extremely short lingual frenulum. And so it's often referred to as tongue tied or fused tongue. And so, like I said, what happens is we typically just take these children to an oral surgeon. They'll snip the lingual frenulum and they won't cut it completely, but they'll cut it in just enough to where the child can have more mobility of their tongue so that they can eat more freely and speak more clearly. Alrighty, salivary glands. So functions of saliva are to cleanse the mouth, to help dissolve food for, and uh, chemicals so that we can taste our food, to moisten the food and compact it into a bolus. And then also we begin the process of a chemical digestion here. And we do so with an enzyme that we call salivary amylase. Salivary amylase is going to begin the breakdown of carbohydrates. So first point that you want to remember in terms of when organic substances are beginning to be broken down, we begin carbohydrate digestion in the oral cavity by salivary amylases. We also have some lipases in the oral cavity that will also begin lipid digestion in the oral cavity. So most saliva is produced by major extrinsic salivary glands that are located outside of the oral cavity, ironically. And then we have minor salivary glands that are scattered throughout the oral cavity um, and they're augmented slightly. So the major salivary glands that are located 
outside of the oral cavity are the parotid glands. This is found anterior to the ear and, exter and, and external to the masseter muscle. Um, the parotid duct opens into the oral vestibule next to the second upper molar. And I'm sure you don't have to know that to that detail depending on your class. Then we have the submandibular glands that are gonna be found medial to the body of the mandible. And you have a duct that opens into the base of the lingual frenulum. And then we have the sublingual glands that are anterior to the submandibular glands under the tongue. So here we have a diagram um, showing us the salivary gland. So here we have our large parotid salivary gland and notice it's located outside of the oral cavity. Then we have our sublingual gland and then here we have our submandibular. All of these glands located outside of the oral cavity. And then we have just a, a, an electron microscopic view of our salivary gland. Now, salivary glands are composed of two types of secretory cells. We have our serous cells and mucous cells. So serous cells produce watery secretions. They also produce enzymes, ions, and a bit of mucin, a bit of mucus. And then we have mucous cells that are gonna produce the majority of our mucus. So the parotid and the submandibular glands contain mostly serous cells, meaning they're gonna be secreting more water, more enzymes, more ions but the sublingual glands are gonna contain um, mostly mucus cells. So they will be producing more of the mucus-like structure, which is why our saliva can be thicker. Even if we're not sick, saliva typically has a little bit of viscosity to it. All right, exonerosemium is dry mouth, which is an uncomfortable condition that's caused by too little saliva production. Um, so, Producing normal amounts of saliva is really needed for oral health. Um, a lack of moisture may lead to difficulty in chewing, difficulty in swallowing, as well as the ability for, for more oral infections to occur. Um, this type of condition can be caused by medication, it can be caused by diabetes, HIV AIDS, um, and other types of syndromes. In terms of what the composition of saliva is, it's going to be mostly water, roughly 97 to 99 percent. It's going to be slightly acidic, between 6.75 and 7. We'll commonly find electrolytes like sodium and potassium, chlorine, things like that. We're going to have salivary amylase, the enzyme that begins the breakdown of carbohydrate digestion in the oral cavity, and we find lingual lipase, which is going to begin the digestion of lipids in the oral cavity. We'll find some proteins, we'll find some metabolic waste, and then we'll find lysozyme, immunoglobin A, defenses, nitric oxide, nitric oxide um, and all of these are gonna help to protect food against microorganisms. Um, here's an animation about a rotating head and just giving us a different view of the oral cavity the parotid glands, sublingual glands, submandibular glands. Um, you can spend a little bit more time on this if you have this PowerPoint, depending on you know, what textbook you're using. So the, co the control of salivation. So roughly on average, we produce about 1,500 milliliters per day. The minor glands are gonna continuously keep the mouth moist. So if you think about it, your mouth is never truly dry. You could feel like it. Right now, my mouth feels kind of dry, but your mouth is never truly just desert dry. The major salivary glands are activated by the parasympathetic division of the nervous system. When we ingest food, um, this is going to stimulate chemoreceptors and mechanoreceptors in the mouth that will then send signals to salivatory nuclei in the brain stem that will then stimulate the parasympathetic division um, or the parasympathetic impulses that will then travel down to cranial nerve seven and cranial nerve nine. Strong sympathetic stimulation will inhibit salivation and does result in dry mouth. Um, and then like we talked about before, smell and sight of food or an upset GI tract can also act as a stimulus to saliva. So for instance, if I am throwing up, your mouth tends to produce saliva because of that. So let's look at another homeostatic imbalance. So decaying primary teeth can be 
painful and may lead to serious infection, remember that our primary teeth are also called our, bra our, our, our baby teeth. And I know some people um, are like, you know, what's the point of spending all this money to have baby teeth extracted? They're going to fall out anyway, kind of waste the money. But your, the health of your baby teeth directly affects the health of your adult teeth. So if you have an infection in your primary teeth or your baby teeth, that infection can also infect and um, potentially affect your adult teeth. So primary teeth deserve as much attention as permanent teeth. They are serving the place as, they're serving the role of placeholders for our underlying developing permanent teeth. So it's very important to make sure that you are brushing baby's teeth, that if you have concerns, you're taking them to the dentist, that you're keeping care of those primary teeth as if they were permanent teeth. So primary teeth can be kept healthy by brushing them, limiting exposure to sugary liquids, and then um, preventing prolonged bottle feeding. On the topic of teeth, let's go a little bit deep, uh, deeper. So teeth lie in sockets and gum covered margins of the mandible and the maxilla, mandible maxilla. Mastication is going to be the formal term for chewing, and that is going to obviously tear our food and grind our food and prepare it for swallowing. Dentition and dental formulation. So we have our primary dentition, which represents our primary teeth or our baby teeth. We have 20 of them when we are um, infants and babies. I should say more to babies. Um, and our primary dentition can be referred to as deciduous teeth. It can be referred to as milk teeth or baby teeth. And they begin to erupt out of our gums around six months. And then by the time a child is two, they typically have all of their teeth. Underlying the primary dentition will be the permanent teeth, and we have 32 of those. They're, um, they're going to develop while roots of the milk teeth are reabsorbed from below, causing them to loosen up and fall out. And then, of course, once the primary teeth fall out, that gives room for the permanent teeth to grow and to develop. This is going to occur right around the age of six to about 12, and it can occur a little sooner. Um, beginning at the age of five. So all but our third molars, our wisdom teeth, are in by the time we reach adolescence. And your third molars can come in any time from age 17 to about 25. Um, my third molars came in, I want to say around my, I don't know, 19 or 20. And when I was 22, I remember going to work one day, I ironically worked for an oral surgeon, and I was like, gosh, I'm feeling like discomfort here, this area felt a little swollen, took some x-rays and found out that one of my third molars was coming in sideways instead of coming in this way. Um, and so then of course I had my wisdom teeth out, but they were coming in right around early 20s. So when we're looking at teeth, we can classify them according to shape. So we have incisors, we have canines, and then we have premolars that we call bicuspids. So these are gonna be the teeth that are gonna come in prior to our third molars, typically by the time we reach adolescence. So the incisors are gonna be our chiseling. Um, they have more of a chisel shape for cutting. Then we have our canines that are for tearing and piercing. And then we have our premolars or our bicuspids that have broad crowns that are going to be um, there to grind and crush our food. And then our molars are going to have broad crowns as well. They are best for grinding. So, you know, if you think about it, you chew, bite into your food or tear into your food. So that's going to be a combination of your incisors and your canines. And then it's gonna be your premolars and then your molars that really grind up your food and prepare it for swallowing. So here we have a diagram showing us what our um, deciduous milk teeth look like compared to what our permanent teeth look like. So here we have our incisors, they begin developing between six to eight months. Then we have the canines here, they come around age 16 to 20 months. 
And then we've got the first molars and second molars that will develop between 10 months and two years. Then we notice for the incisor, I mean, for the permanent teeth, first of all, we have more of them. We have um, 16 on each side versus 10. So we have our incisors, then we have our canines, premolars, and then molars. If you needed a formula, because some of us like that, it you know, makes it a little easier for us. The dental formula is a shorthand indicator of number and position of teeth. And so it shows the ratio of upper teeth to lower teeth for only half of the mouth. The other side is gonna obviously mirror it. So um, we have two incisors, one cuspid, two molars, and then you've got times two, and that gives us 20 teeth. And then for our permanent teeth, we have two incisors, one cuspid, um, two premolars, and three molars times two, and that gives us 30 teeth. Now looking more at the structure of a tooth, each tooth has two major regions. We have the crown and we have the root. So a lot of times when people are like, smile, show your teeth, we're actually should be saying smile, show your crowns. And you know, no one's gonna say that because no one's gonna say that. But technically, the crown is what we actually see. It's gonna be the, the exposed part above the gingiva or our gum, so here and here. It's gonna be covered by enamel, which is gonna be the hardest substance that we can find in the body. It's actually harder than bone. Um, it's gonna be heavily, um, it'll, it, it will contain large amounts of minerals, such as calcium, salt, and hydroapatite crystals. And then it has enamel producing cells that will degenerate when the tooth erupts. Um, so there's no healing if tooth decays or cracks do occur, which is why we need fillings in our teeth when we get cavities. And then the root of the tooth is actually gonna be the portion that is embedded in the jawbone, and it connects to the crown by the neck. Our canines and our incisors and our premolars have only one root. Um, the first upper premolar often has two, and then the first two upper molars have three roots, the first two lower molars have two roots. And then the third molar, the roots will vary. They're often single fused roots. And depending on how the roots are will also affect the ease to which teeth can fall out or be pulled out. Looking at the tooth some more and looking at structures of the tooth, we have cement, which is gonna be calcified connective tissue. It's gonna cover the root and it's going to attach it to the periodontal ligament. Then we have the periodontal ligament. This is gonna be a fibrous joint that we call the gomphophis, so gomphophis, gomphosis. Um, so this is going to be going back to AMP1 when we were talking about joints. And so this uh, gompho gomphosis um, or this ligament is gonna to help to anchor the tooth in the bony socket. Then we have the gingival sulcus, which is gonna be a groove where the gingiva borders the tooth. So if you look right around here, the ridges of your um, gums. And then we have dentin, which is a bone-like material that's under the enamel. And it's gonna be maintained by odontoblasts of the pulp cavity. Cavity is gonna be surrounded by dentin. Then we have the actual pulp, which is gonna be connective tissue. It's gonna be blood vessels and nerves. We have the root canal, and this is going to be um, the extension of the pulp cavity to the root. And then we have the apical foramen at the proximal end of the root. So it's going to be an entryway for blood vessels, nerves, and So here we have a cross-section of a tooth, a canine specifically within its bony socket. So we start off with the crown of the tooth. So everything above the gingiva is what we're referring to as the crown. We have the enamel. Then we go into dentin here. Then we get into the pulp cavity. So it's gonna contain blood vessels and nerves. Moving down, we have the root of the canal. And then um, we get deeper into eventually the bone or the bony area of the um, tooth. 
looking at some of these external structures here would be um, our gingiva. This would be the gingival soulfish right here. This is the crown of the tooth. This middle portion would be the neck of the tooth. And then we have the whole root of the tooth. So this light tannish structure right here is gonna be the cement. Then we have the periodontal ligament here, which is this white striated structure. And then this is the apical foramen. And then lastly, the bone that our sockets bun to be formed by. So some homeostatic imbalances that we can have with our teeth. Number one, we can have impacted teeth. And that's basically a tooth that did not um, protrude through the gum. So this tooth is remained and trapped in the jawbone. A lot of times your um, molars can be impacted. So when I was telling you all earlier that my one of my wisdom tooth was growing this way, it was impacted. It was below the gingiva. Um, the other, actually all of my wisdom teeth were so impacted. None of them had actually broken through the gingiva. Um, this can cause a good deal of pressure and pain, and it did. And uh, most of the time, like I said, you mostly find impacted teeth, especially as an adult with your wisdom teeth. And how to treat it, surgically remove the teeth. So dental caries and other types of gum disease, tooth and gum disease. Dental caries are, that's a formal term for cavities. And basically it's when we have demineralization of the enamel. So minerals being removed from the enamel and dentin. And this can be caused by bacteria. So dental plaque is going to be a film that covers our teeth, and it's basically going to be a film of sugar, bacteria, and debris. And so this dental plaque will adhere to our teeth, and then acids from the bacteria will begin to break down these calcium salts, demineralization. And then we'll have proteolytic enzymes that will digest the organic matter of the tooth, and that will then form the dental caries. So prevention of this would be to continuously floss your teeth, brush your teeth, of course, go to your dentist, so that if you do have a um, dental carry forming, they can then put a filling in it so it doesn't um, harm and erode more of that tooth. Gingivitis is another type of disease and it affects the gum. So what happens with gingivitis is that plaque will calcify to form a calculus or a tartar. And then this calculus will disrupt the seal between the gingiva and the teeth. And so a lot of times with gingivitis, the gums are really swollen. You can kind of see the gums kind of like receding from the teeth in some cases. Um, and you have this anaerobic bacteria that will affect the gum, which leads to the overall odor of gingivitis um, that people will have, the odor of someone's mouth when they have gingivitis. And if, um, in most cases, you can get rid of gingivitis if the calculus is removed. Periodontitis or periodontal disease. So when I was in my early 20s, um, I had very, very severe crowding of my teeth and my teeth were all types of not straight. So I went to the dentist and they recommended braces and I was 22 and I remember thinking like, don't really know how I feel about being a brace face as a young adult. And he was like, well, because you have so much crowding, your teeth naturally kind of crowd together as you age. And he was like, I'm afraid that if you don't get braces to straighten out your teeth, you could eventually develop periodontal disease as an adult or as an older adult. And so what is this? Basically, this is neglected gingivitis and it can escalate to a disease. So what the dentist was telling me was that because of the excessive crowding in your mouth, that could lead to periodontal disease, but that would initially lead to gingivitis because I wouldn't be able to properly clean between my teeth because flossing was hard and things like that. So what happens is immune cells will attack not only the bacteria that we have within the oral cavity, but it then will, it will also attack normal body tissues. So it can destroy the periodontal ligament. It can activate osteoclasts to break down the bone matrix. Um, and that can lead to tooth loss because then your teeth won't be embedded in the socket of your bone as securely as it normally would. 
It can increase in heart disease and in stroke, which is really interesting because most people don't think, you know, oral disease can have an effect on their heart, but this is how. So number one, it can promote atherosclerotic plaque formation. And then two, bacteria can enter our bloodstream from the, from the oral cavity. Um, and then that bacteria can cause clots that could either form clots within our heart or clots within the brain, leading to a heart attack or a stroke. And risk factors for this particular disease are going to be smoking, diabetes mellitus, or oral piercings. And that is it. There is another, um, there's actually two more parts to this chapter. So I'm gonna hopefully record those soon so that if you're following along in this textbook or another textbook, you can keep, um, you can keep following along. So thank you guys so much for watching and I hope to see you in the next video.